thanks very much, Joe. So I, I, um, I appreciate being here. I, uh, Joe mentioned um, I teach a class now, just started this year. This great big lecture class I co teach with somebody else on. It's called Roads, Mind, and Society, or something like that. And so many different levels of analysis, such an interesting topic that you could attack, you could think about from all these different levels. And of course, you know, in, in my actual job, I do this tiny little thing that's just one little piece of it. Uh, and, and so I feel like a poser half the time, telling them about things like, about, you know, grassroots meetings that exist. I think about them. And, um, <laughs> it's great to be here and hear um, um, the comments from the two speakers that um, um, I got to listen to. So I appreciate that. Um, so, um, in, um, I, I shall also say that my, like, point of entry here is very um, specific and different than I think um, uh, most people's point of entry in this room, in that for me, the, the 12 step, which I know from, from your point of view, it's like this huge thing that's everywhere, and it's like, well, what else is there, what else can there be, what else works, what else might work better for some people, from my point of view, I, I don't even know, I don't see about, I don't see 12 step, right? I, I hear about um, the specific brands of psychotherapy um, that come out of academia with that long lag that the, um, Marty uh, mentioned. I love the, the, the um, progress measured in funerals. <laughs> uh, so, but, but in, in the, the academic, medical, um, realm, um, there's been a, a, a history to how um, addiction has become something that is at least in part seen in medical terms, um, and these are paraphrasings of the criteria that make up what is the definition of addiction or substance dependence uh, as we currently have it and it's about to change because there, there's a new version coming out exciting and interesting, um, but I'll just avoid the controversies that, that are going to be um, at the door when that one hits, uh, and just say, for these, um, you can think about those first two I've got circled as really the first wave, I think, of, of mainstream medical treatment of addiction, or, or thinking about it in terms of um, a medical phenomenon or even a, a psychological phenomenon. So there's this thing that can be measured, <coughs> tolerance and withdrawal. There are biomarkers. You can see tolerance and you can work with it in the lab and you can extend it to interesting things like conditions withdrawal. And, and, and so for in the 50s, 60s, this was the big area of progress. And then following that, this, this grouping at the bottom, which I'm, this is just my it, it seems like a grouping to me. These have to do with the power of drugs, what makes them compelling, what makes them um, uh, rewarding to individuals. Uh, these, these three criteria, I think, have to do with, with, with that. Um, and we learned a great deal in the 80s and 90s about what that's all about from the standpoint of neuroscience. This was a period where we were able new tools come out and you could see new things and we could see commonalities in most of the drugs that um, people get into trouble with in terms of what they do to particular circuitry in the brain. So particular um, systems were identified that are relevant to these three. Um, but still leaves what to me is the most interesting piece of this, which is these this uh, self-control struggle piece. So this intention, this back and forth, which I think happens over time, and an intention is, is made and then behavior doesn't stick, doesn't conform to that intention. Um, uh, so these are, this self-control segment is um, captured in these two criteria, taking more than intended and unsuccessful efforts to, to cut down. Uh, this is a quote from a, a prominent psychologist from 1973. Principles of animal behavior 
can provide a basis for a theory of human drug use and abuse, but that voluntary control of addictive behavior requires uniquely human cognitive processing. So this, this is roughly the, you know, there's no huge mystery from the standpoint of neuroscience in terms of why people get into trouble with substances. Now, of course, this too is a complicated um, actual issue because people take drugs for different reasons and get different things from it and, and, and of course these things get simplified when they are put in the lab. But at least you know at least you can you can get rats to self-administer drugs to the point of being in bad shape. Uh, that can be modeled. Uh, so we can play with brain circuitry, we can play with chemistry and, and, and get inside what at least looks like the same kind of process that is at least a big piece of what makes drugs compelling to people. But what do you make of when people, despite having this path of very quick access to reward or relief, stop? How, is, how does that happen? Now that's something that Logan in this quote is arguing is, is um, hard to model. Our animal models don't seem to do it justice. But as a psychologist, my uh, presumption is that it is as much rooted in our brains as anything else. And so the challenge is, okay, can, can we both acknowledge that this is uh, probably involving processes that are too complex to be modeled in animals? So we do some degree of justice to just how distinctly human and complex it is when people voluntarily stop, but at the same time don't resort to something mystical purely in our description as we still hopefully can identify um, gears that turn at some level. So this, and, and I think there is this general tension between simplification so that we can study it in, uh, as scientists uh, and um, you know, an appreciation for what the actual phenomenon is. And, um, Sometimes you can look at research and you can say, well, you know, they're clearly oversimplifying it to the point that it's meaningless, the progress that's being made. But the tension is you want to operationalize, you want to make that question something that you can at least keep busy trying to answer. And then, and then you worry about whether your answer means anything. I, I'm, I'm going to sort of be um, um, dealing, I think, with that spectrum in what I talk about. What, uh, so, so I should speak to what time? I have more slides. Than that. <laughs> <laughs> also, well, officially 12:15, but we won't have. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it close. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when people do recover, so thinking about that mysterious process that uh, Logan was referring to, that doesn't seem to be modeled so well with our rats. Well, when people they when people do recover, when they do this thing of stopping this well-established pattern, what do they say? Well, let's at least think about what people say as a starting point. They might talk about having hit rock bottom. And here I'm, I'm collecting things that I've read that may or may not be represented. They may talk of a spiritual awakening. They may talk of a life-changing experience. They often experience it as a struggle, one that is um, uh, often described as the greatest struggle of their lives. Uh, and they may have utilized some uh, fellowship group. And um, uh, when I was uh, kind of getting interested in the, the phenomenon of uh, self-control struggle, and um, I started to, to work in an addiction um, group at the University of Pennsylvania as a postdoc, there was this study that was just coming out that kind of stuck with me. Um, and, uh, uh, the, the, it was a face-off between a competition between different um, types of treatment for cocaine addiction, and um, in psychiatry and psychology research, there's a lot of these sorts of face-off studies, and the usual results are very boring because the usual results are within any <coughs> particular treatment there are 
therapist effects. So there are good therapists and bad therapists. But then you compare the treatments and there's always a tie. They basically, you know, they all are good and we can all feel good, but nobody really wins and we don't know what we've learned by the million dollars we've spent on the study. Uh, but this one seemed, at least in the short term, to have an answer and it was one that I thought was surprising. And this was, um, I'm simplifying the study. Everybody got, everybody was, in, was encouraged, with multi-site, 400 or 500 participants, was encouraged to do 12-step facilitation, I mean, to do, excuse me, to do 12, to go to meetings, and I'm, I'm guessing it was all, or virtually all 12-step meetings. Uh, and in addition, three groups were randomized to also get an individual treatment. I'm just going to focus on that. One, it was cognitive behavioral therapy, so they got one-on-one -on -one time with a professional CBT, and this was coming out of University of Pennsylvania where CBT started, so you know they got a fair shake in terms of this competition. Uh, supportive expressive therapy, another style of psychotherapy. Uh, and the third was just one-on-one -on -one time with a, a drug counselor, somebody who was themselves likely through the 12-step program or something like that, and their one-on-one -on -one time was just geared at pushing that line or getting them to go to meetings, those sorts of things. I actually don't have a clear idea of what goes on in these meetings, but, um, but these were the results. This was the percentage of lost I switched, I, I did this on a Mac, and I, um, I lose some things, I think, on the, when I go to PC, but the percentage of people who were um, abstinent for this much time during the study, one month, number of, so the, the longer the, the period of time that they made it, the fewer made that hurdle. Uh, and you see the 12-step group actually beat these professional psychotherapies. I'm sure the, the CBT people were disappointed by these results. It seemed like, wow, well, that's interesting. What's going on there? And if you break it down, if you, one of the things they did in the study was ask each day, um, or each weeks, I think three times, how much are you craving now? Which is thinking about the, going back to the drug. Uh, and they looked at, uh, they separated out work, uh, between low, medium, and high, just breaking it into three groups, um, and looked at whether they took, um, uh, they were mostly crack smoke, smoking individuals, whether they smoked crack the next week as a function of which of those, how much craving they said they had. And if you split it up like that, the place where you saw this differential, that is the purple bar being low, this is the amount of percentage of people who actually use that next week, the place where that purple bar is different than the other two is that high craving um, um, response to the high craving, I'm presuming it's response, what happened the week after. And it was there where they looked better than the professional psychotherapies. And that sort of fits the common sense way that people use the word willpower. So if you're not in the mood for something, it's not willpower to not do it. But if you have the urge and don't, then people, um, you know, in everyday life, we, we call that an act of self-control or willpower. Um, uh, so that's interesting. So from my point of view, I'm thinking, okay, well, I, if we're interested as psychologists in the mechanics of what's going on with self-control and willpower, uh, you know, we should be paying attention to what's coming out in grassroots organizations and try to understand um, what is actually the um, active ingredient in these sorts of things. And please feel free to uh, stop me at any point. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, as a psychologist and a neuroscientist, um, the ways in which um, I and others uh, think about self-control. And, and the big distinction, I think, is between um, what you could call um, dual systems models of self-control or synchronic competition, that is, that self-control struggle finds its, you know, who, who is the struggle between? Well, one, I have one answer um, uh, that I think is more appealing than real, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. But one answer uh, is that it has to do with a competition between different neural systems. So we have in us one way of thinking, uh, or one brain, I should say, one brain system, and uh, that has one set of interests, and 
but also a second brain system and that has a different set of interests. And when we are feeling ambivalence about something, that experience is actually the manifestation of these two systems that are in competition. While I, I say from the beginning, I think that's a very intuitive way of thinking about it. Uh, I think in the end, as far as the neuroscience, it's not quite uh, what's going on. And I'll uh, hopefully give you a, a, a sense of why I think it's you, different. you want to interrupt or... Please, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, it doesn't... I, like I said, back to the, the, the studies. Yeah. Comparing the groups. Yeah. Is there, uh, have there been any hypotheses uh, about why the 12th century seem to, seem to be more successful? Well, so that, that it may not seem like much progress, but that second graph I showed you, the first one was from the original paper, which I think was published in Archives of General Psychiatry, that showed that if there was a group difference. This, that second graph was a, several years later, a, later a follow-up analysis that tried to see to get a little bit inside of, of what was making a difference. And their conclusion was that you might have some of response to craving being differentially um, impacted by the different um, um, approaches. But yeah. Um, but, and there's, I think there's studies that look, try to look at, well, um, are the people who succeed more, you know, is it the social side of things? And, all those things are purely correlational. It's very difficult to, to make any strong interpretations from correlations because you don't know people are self-selecting into all these things. So um, um, th there's really, I don't think, much more to be gained from that data set in, in particular. But then there are tons of other studies that try to, tons, a few studies at least, that try to separate out um, pieces that are thought by some to be active ingredients of 12 step especially, because that's gotten the most attention. You shouldn't compare a group to 12 step. Well, this study, I've, I've cut it a little bit. This group, there was actually four groups. Oh, group CBT. Uh, I see, that's interesting. So you had, so you want it, like apples to apples, you want a group CBT with a single facilitator. My intuition is that yeah. the, the social pressure is a very powerful ingredient. Yeah. Uh, group identification. Well, so all the all across the groups, they all were going to meetings, the 12 steps. So they all had that. That was a constant in the three. Um, but only one group had this kind of uh, pairing that was maybe synergistic between what the individual was saying and what the group was saying. I, I certainly don't want to. The take home message, I definitely don't mean to be that 12 step B is better than CBT or supportive expressive therapy. Only that for me, it suggested that um, there was something interesting to look at with regard to um, basically facilitation systems that, that um, emerge organically, which you know, is, is probably not interesting from your point of view because it's common sense that who knows, who knows what works of people who are involved with the addiction. Uh, but from an outsider's point of view, it's, it's, um, it was kind of a, a wake up to me as far as um, the distinction between what's going on in psychology research versus what's going on in the rest of the world. How much time was in the study? The, it, they, they followed them up, I believe, a year. A year. Uh -huh. um, there, it's difficult to even further out you go, especially with a, a crack addicted population. The, top, the, the yield of getting people back is always um, it makes it challenging to interpret the results. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to argue, I'll, I'll show you a little bit about um, the dual system models. Uh, maybe I'll skip over some stuff because the one part I do want to get to is what I think is critical for understanding um, what people are um, thinking about in everyday self-control. What I think is an actual uh, important insight, it's not my insight, but uh, uh, to get there I, I do want to get um, cover that second large bullet, the intertemporal bargaining models. And if I have time, which I'm sure I won't, I'll talk about it some fMRI work. No, I actually forget that. Um, uh, I'm going to skip some slides here, but I'll just tell you that, remember I mentioned this trade-off between simplifying so that you can actually do good science um, versus actually making contact with the phenomenon. One very simple model that's sometimes used for 
um, self-control is called response inhibition. So basically, you start to do something. You can think of it as um, um, it's a good example. You um, can't think of an example, so I'm going to tell you what the actual what the actual task is. You uh, you have to respond as quickly as you can, whether something is pointing to the left or right, um, but once in a while a tone after the target appears comes on and you have to stop this thing that you're doing. So it's basically your ability to pull back on a motor response. Um, that's been studied a great deal and we know a lot about the brain circuitry that's relevant to that and there's been some some evidence, not very convincing, but, but um, uh, that there is some general connection between this and, uh, and addictive behavior so that maybe there's a generalized um, inhibitory control phenomenon that we can get into with this kind of simple laboratory task that has some relevance to whether somebody can, oh, I just got the idea of using, that sounded good, but wait a second, can I stop that plan that got set in motion? That's, um, you know, that's the sort of connection that people are looking to make, and we can, um, uh, and, and uh, skip some results on this. So, so there's some suggestion that it, that's consistent with this, but I will tell you, but, but for reasons that I'll get to, I don't think that's a big piece of the puzzle. Um, uh, what? It's <laughs> a <laughs> so Narcotics Anonymous meeting, and they just did the serenity prayer. <laughs> slowly over time. We don't get our life back all at once. So, um, the simple-minded idea is, okay, well, if that's the case, then maybe some people, you know, in general, the, the immediate looms larger than the, the, the expected future, but maybe this is more true for some people than, than others. Maybe some of us are more present-focused than others, and if that's the case, then that'd be a reasonable candidate for a risk factor for, for addiction. Um, and so um, psychologists have tried to come up with ways of op operationalizing, of, of putting a number on the extent to which you versus 
somebody else um, devalues things as a function of their delay. Their what's called temporal or delay discount. So we all discount things in the future. Some people maybe do it more than others. And the, the standard is many things ways you could do this, but um, one approach is to give people, and it's the most common approach, questions about money. Do you want, would you prefer $1,000 now or $1,000 in a year? So I'm just giving you a bunch of questions at once, but think of them each independently. Everybody would say, duh, $1,000 now for sure. If it's $100 now or $1,000 in a year, question 10, by no means all, but most people say, well, I'll, I'll wait the year for a tenfold increase on my money. Um, but somewhere in between, people are at the point of stochastic indifference. It's like, well, you know, half the time you ask them $600, I'm just imagining for somebody, at $600, they might say, I'll take it now. I'll take the 600 now, but maybe another time you ask them, they'll say, oh, wait, they're right there on their indifference point. That tells us something. That gives us a way to put a number on it. That says, by virtue of being delayed one year, 1,000 was devalued to be worth just 600. So it gives us a way to quantify uh, people's present focus, the degree to which they discount the future. Lots of studies have looked at whether um, people who are either currently addicted to substances or in the past were addicted to substances do this temporal discounting more than some comparison group. Um, and what I'm showing you is a collection of about 10 or so of these studies. Uh, is a met, it's called meta-analysis. It just looks at how, try to collapse across studies and say, make a generalization. And um, the, 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 the finding, for what it's worth, is yes, they, uh, there is a difference. The effect size you would consider to be, in psychology terms, moderate. Basically, if the 50th percentile in the one group is like the 60th percentile in the other, it's not a huge, not a huge effect. Um, but there's an on average difference. What's an effect size? Uh, it's it's a stats is question. So it's basically um, if you think of the distribution of the population, the easiest way to think of it. So think of the bell curve of the population. If you want to know how the effect size it would tell you, we've got two populations, two separate bell curves. How much is the one moved over? And this tells us that the one is moved over um, basically a little bit, just about to the so that the midpoint of one is at the 60th percentile of the other. I guess the, the punchline is, it's a small but, but consistent, relatively consistent effect. Um, there's another question that you might ask, what does that mean? Does that mean it's, was that there before? I mean, the, the, the emphasis in the literature is on the interpretation that it is a risk factor, but it's equally plausible that it's a consequence of being in that um, mind state, of being in that situation. There's some interesting data that's recently come out that's looked at people who, um, you know, longitudinally, who were, um, who moved, transitioned from a heroin addiction to a methadone, depend, methadone uh, maintenance, uh, and they shift. They shift the discount less deeply. So I think that some evidence that at least part of the causal arrow is in the other direction. Now, this gets a little bit into inside stuff, but um, there was a lot of excitement about an idea um, um, that basically this temporal discounting comes from a competition between brain systems uh, that are uh, both um, part of us. That one, there's one old brain system that is very present focused and one newer brain system that's more the lateral prefrontal cortex and parietal cortex that is far-sighted. Um, and I won't try to give you the details in the amount of time I have, but, but the argument was that the results from initial brain imaging studies were putting, their, putting the collective finger on these two brain systems. So the quote in a, a paper that's been very well cited in, in, in uh, neuroscience literature, particularly by areas a little outside of this special specialty, because within the specialty we now have been moderately discredited, but the idea is seductive. It's competition between lower level automatic processes that may reflect 
evolutionary adaptations to particular environments, and a more recently evolved uniquely human capacity for abstract domain, general reasoning, and future planning. Okay, so that's, I, I, I should make this credit is, is too strong. There's data that um, doesn't conform to the pattern that this, this predicts. So the, um, this is attractive to the economists because to the extent that they deal with self-control struggle, uh, this is one of, this is basically based on an economic model of um, a two-factor model of self-control and temporal discounting. And it's also a nice fit, and the reason it gets picked up, I think, uncritically, is because it, it's a wonderful fit with our intuitions that we have, our devil and our angel that are part of us, and, um, and, and there's where the competition resides. A few reasons why I think, on the face of it, this isn't going to be a satisfactory mapping by itself of self control struggle and, and the, the you know I, I do this sort of work and I do think the modularity that exists in, in the brain is this, this exciting new piece of information we have and it's the best chance of making new progress or making progress um, but I'm going to be arguing in the next five minutes that we need to think about this uh, self control this um, intertemporal bargaining perspective as well a couple points that still fit well with the um, angel devil conception. Um, it's secure, securing a drug is not like a reflex, so um, uh, it, it often brings out the uh, cognitive best in the people who are seeking the drug. <laughs> so, if you imagine that there was the, the dumb system was the devil, you would, you would at least have to grant that it has full power over whatever the smart system is during that. So there's some uh, something that needs to be wrestled with with that conception um, right off the bat. Another, it's a subtle point, but craving doesn't work the way you'd want it to work if the idea was we have the things that we truly want, but then we get this thing, this exogenous hit of craving, and that thing, if it's strong enough, pushes us away from the things that we actually want. The piece that I find to not fit with that way of thinking, um, uh, uh, this is a quote from uh, a Nobel Prize winning economist, um, uh, but other people have made this, uh, have noticed this. Addicts suffer noticeably less withdrawal discomfort when in an establishment that has a reputation for absolute incorruptibility, unbribable guards, etc. Cardiac pulmonary patients who are told flatly that they must stop completely at once if they want to survive the year and stop from smoking report surprisingly less withdrawal discomfort than those uh, who succeed in quitting after getting the less absolute advice. This was sort of in the lore, like the, the, the professional ideas, but without any data. Uh, a nice paper in Psychopharmacology came out a couple of years ago that put this to the test with acidic Jews who were smokers who had it very well established on the Sabbath. They did not smoke. Uh, and they compared that to a couple other conditions, regular days, and a day with less absolutes, uh, but an in intent to not smoke. And that low line is the amount of craving that they experienced throughout the days, throughout the Sabbath. So you, perking up there at 7 o'clock when the sun goes down. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> so the idea, the subtle point is that it's not as though the craving is hitting and it is before our choice and leading from the outside to a choice, but the choice itself feed, is feeding back to the craving. When there's some mental foreplay with the act, I might really do it, there is an explosion of craving. So we have to think of craving in a, it puts craving in a different place than I think the simple-minded approach has it. I think of the times when, the you know, a surprise would make it worse, where I would be invited to dinner, expecting to have several drinks, mm -hmm. and get there, and the people say, well, we don't drink. And I would have a terrible time. On the other hand, if we were new in advance, that these people didn't drink and there were no alcohol. Yeah. The problem was nearly as severe. Yeah. So Does that relate to yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So it says that you were doing something. There was something that was happening in your mind that was 
getting ready for this that's thing. That's the foreplay in your mind. And so that's you what you got drunk before the here. Huge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, let me skip over one so I can get to you. I just want to say one thing positive because I'm just saying, I'm just casting <laughs> stones on. But this is, I think, the exciting um, um, point that um, comes mainly from the work of um, my mentor, George Andrew. Um, uh, and I'll just give you what I think are the key ingredients. So, so we don't make decisions, and this gets right to this issue of, well, what can't we model so well with the rats? People do not treat every decision they make as a single decision. That is, unlike the rat, we see things in categories and make decisions about those categories. We may not stick with those decisions, but we, we are ready as linguistic creatures to think about categories of behavior. We also make plans for our future self. That is, we don't just decide, we don't just make a decision at that choice point where we actually affect the decision. We, in advance, come up with a plan. Um, if your future self, so you have one of these things, a plan about your behavior, in some cases your future self is a foreseeable <coughs> to your current plan. Your current self wants something, but mm, you remember you wanted that thing in the past and your own future self got in the way. That's already a starting point that puts you in a different place than the rats. Um, and we can just think of this situation, simplify it, imagine two alternatives um, paired with two time points. So we can always either drink or be sober. Um, and the time points are now and, the, and in the future. Okay, so we are making a decision about now and the future. Um, and um, imagine that sober begins with a C because of uh, something that I won't get into. Okay, so C stands for sober. So we can either be drunk now, we can choose to be drunk now and drunk in the future. We can choose to be drunk now and sober in the future, or be sober now and drunk in the future. That's that, nobody chooses that. Or sober now and sober in the future. Those are four, are four in principle, alternatives. Now, if those are really the alternatives, given what we know about motivation, if that's all we've got, then self control, th then the most compelling alternative is always going to be drunk now and sober tomorrow. I'll eat the cake now and I'll die tomorrow. Then you've got everything. You've got the best of, of both worlds. You have these self-control problems when the preference is different for the now and the future. So the, the typical self-control problem, if these four are really the options, the most attractive is number one, drunk now, sober in the future, but of course tomorrow comes and then tomorrow is the now. So it's drunk today and sober in the future, and obviously you never get to a point where that stops. Because with experience, we realize that our plans are uncertain. And at that point, it's not that the drunk now, sober tomorrow becomes unappealing, it's that it becomes implausible. We have said that in the past, and we've failed in the past, so we we learn to not trust that as an option. So if that's seen as not an option, if we see it no longer not, uh, as, as attainable, if it's the case that sober now, sober in the future beats drunk now, drunk in the future, then you've got the ingredients, I think the starting ingredients for potentially successful self-control. And from this is kind of a, a different way of thinking uh, from common sense economic way of, of imagining human behavior, it's not that the one cigarette ever is seen as not worth it. What if you really want that cigarette, it'd be great right now. What is the, the literal downside of one cigarette? One cigarette is very small, it's very uncertain, it's very far in the future. If I see that one cigarette as just one cigarette, there is no hope that I won't smoke it. And, and this is, you know, why do people say it's just this one? Well, it's a bad decision. Each one is a bad decision if you're thinking about it in strict economic terms. But that's not how we're doing business. 
we come to see individual cases as being important as uh, precedents for our behavior within the category. So that one cigarette, I might say no if that one cigarette isn't just that one cigarette, but my whole resolution is seen as importantly in the balance with that one choice. So that's kind of, a, a, um, I think it's people all do that and all know it, but it's basically foreign to most of um, academic treatments of the topic, um, which treat these decisions as um, happening in isolation. So the, the, the insight, I think, is to see the critical ingredient as being a perceived connection between individual acts and these larger categories of behavior. So to get back to this, this um, uh, these two different ways of doing the modeling, uh, so, um, to understand, I think, what people are actually have in mind when they ex uh, are trying to, what they're trying to explain with regard to self-control struggle and ambivalence, it is this process that has to play out over time between plans, resolutions, transgressions, regret, a, recon a, a reconsideration of what each act means, a, 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 this, this special sort of plan that we call a resolution, what, what is the force of that plan. I'm, I'm, I have some things to say, but nothing much about these, so I'll just throw them out and, and um, stop since I'm over. But, but it's, it's a phenomenon, I think, that can only be understood by thinking of um, the dialogue over time with, within the self. So from the standpoint of neuroscience, the trick is to figure out how what we're learning about brain systems maps onto that dialogue. And I think the seductive misstep is to imagine that it is a direct mapping that we can find the self-control conflict as occurring um, between modules existing in the brain at the same time. So, uh, so how do you take um, questions? Yeah. Let's see. I, it looks to me like you, you sort of have moved the choice point from um, arguing systems back and forth to this assessment of credibility. And so has there been any work in, in sort of how you, how the brain assesses credibility of future options and how it discounts them? That, that seems to be what you've moved to. Yeah. And, you know, it's not, and, and, and you describe it as a yes, no, but it's really probably a, a that's right. That's right. right. All of our tipping points. That's right. And, and, and so, I mean, I, first, the short answer is no, but I love that it's beautiful and put, but it's exactly true. Um, uh, and I've simplified what really we're talking about is the differential, if, there's, if, you, if you want to hold on to rational choice as being what's going on, is the differential between my expected future self's behavior under these two circumstances, the differential of whether I drink today or not, neither probability is zero or one in either case, is that differential seen as, as sufficient? Now, so, so that's where work is sometimes, a little bit is done in modeling how that might happen, and there we get into to, um, game theory approaches, basically. Uh, because it's hard to get inside people's uh, heads in this kind of way. Um, but then there's also this other thing, I think, that makes things yet more complicated. One of the, This is how I think is important for how things sometimes work. But when they fail, maybe it's because people lose hope that their future self will be cooperative even if they are. Maybe it's because they become overconfident and think they can have the defect now and sober later. But I think another thing that sometimes happens is there is also the decision to attend to things or not, and so there is understanding the behavior of attention, and in some, in some cases the individual may willfully, for reward reasons, for reasons that are not huge mysteries, willfully not attend to the aspect of the contingencies, which makes the problem uh, yet harder. So the, 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 the reason I think that this way of looking at things is not dominant is in part because people want to make progress, and this is, there's a lot of invisible variables here, so um, it makes it, it hard. But then again, from my point of view, you know, you want to be actually correct also, and I think this is what happens. <laughs> but you're doing sort of a predictive utility function, so I think you've got some, I mean, it's, it's not that far away from Well, it's a predictive function. utility function, but the key players here, there's an internal feedback of uh -huh. things you can't see. It's my, my own 
okay. preference is affecting my own choice mm -hmm. and my own perceived choice is affecting my own valuation and so that makes it a chaotic system in principle so that's where the game theory comes in. And you might consider looking again at one of the options there which was sober now and drunk in the future uh, because that's a little mental trick that a lot of people in recovery actually yeah. use. Very yeah, successfully. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So this is like the—it's just mm -hmm. too. I can't. The, 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 I thought that I'm going—that I'm going to 